Hello everybody, this is Travis Blaze here at Sketch to Animate and I am coming to you uh, with some questions or answers to questions that you had uh, for those of you that attended the master class two months ago. Uh, we have for you uh, the latest answers to the questions that we never got a chance to get around to and we will be posting this and you will see this on YouTube. So without further ado, I'm going to switch it over to the next screen so we can go ahead and take a look at what some of these questions are. Hey everyone, this is Editing Anita here. Uh, sorry to interrupt you from Travis, but I just wanted to quickly update you on some things with Sketch to Animate before you continue on to the Q&A. Firstly, very excited, we have the t-shirts up. So, you can go to sketchtoanimate.com now, I'll leave a link in the description, and you can go and uh, make your order over there uh, and the orders will be for both domestic and international but just remember to read about um, domestic versus international purchases finally we are preparing for our next event which is super exciting we don't have a date right now but our date will be somewhere at the end of June so if you want to know about when the tickets will be available, you can follow us on our social media. Um, you can sign up to our newsletter and then we will let you know as soon as the tickets are available. So yay. Now you can go back to Travis. All right, here we go. So we've got questions here and I'm just going to read them at the top of the list here. And hopefully I can get through these as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. Uh, we have one question came over and it says, what is the best way for aspiring storyboard artists to break into the industry while in this lockdown COVID environment? Well, I think the best way to kind of keep yourself occupied and break into this industry is really focus on your portfolio. Um, we have a back to basics tutorial on the essentials for storyboarding. And because there are lots and lots of studios out there currently looking for um, artists outside the, uh, the realm of like Los Angeles area and there's people, uh, places all over the world that are in fact looking for artists. I think the, uh, the best way is to really kind of go online and start researching and looking for the story, the, your, your, your top 10 studios that you would like to work for. And then uh, maybe just do the top 20 and go from there and break through. And what you want to do is you want to research them. You really, now that we're, we're all stuck at home still, uh, and it's been over a year now, I, I think it's really good to kind of use your technical and internet skills and really search uh, about each studio. What is their culture? Um, what are the types of people that they hire? Um, what are some of the, pro mainly what are a lot of the projects that they produce and do those fall in line with you? And then what you want to do is you want to take a look at the back to basics essentials for storyboarding uh, for your portfolio that I have in the back to basics section of YouTube, uh, my sketch to animate page. You can then kind of focus in on building your portfolio. This is a great time to start your own short story uh, and maybe board from there. Originality is always going to be the key when it comes to yourself standing out in the crowd. Um, but also get, in, get a really strong foundational skill and understanding of story, uh, story telling, which is including writing, uh, start reading more books, start focusing on cinematic shots, uh, maybe pick up still photography. These are things that I've, I've said before. Cinematography is, is really gonna be an essential tool for you to really understand and grasp um, we have some of the best um, cinematographers in the world out there from, from past and present that we can pull from and look at and uh, learn from. And you can take a lot of what they do, these directors and these cinematographers, and you can transfer them into your own boards and how you view and how you look at uh, cinematics and storyboarding. So that's my suggestions there for you. I hope that helps. 
And let's go down to the next question. It says, if I want to become a cartoon author, which could be a good plan? Starting with storyboarding could be a good option, question mark. Uh, you want to become a cartoon author, what would be a good plan? Well, the, my simple, the most simple thing is, you know, be in the industry, actually have something uh, to say from experience. And the only way you get experience is applying or learning, uh, spending time uh, publishing works, uh, getting, uh, working for a studio, working for a comic uh, company that might be doing graphic novels. Uh, the only way to be uh, an author of cartooning is to really have the knowledge and the history of cartooning and what that is. And storyboarding is a great tool, like I've said before, but you have to have experience. I think you need to really understand and dive into it for a few years before becoming an author. Um, you know, they say it takes about 10,000 hours, right? Well, I mean, that's give or take, but you know, 10 years of being in the industry, five years of being in the industry might be enough information for you to kind of really home in and say that, hey, you know, I have enough information. I have something to tell. I think it's a different direction and something new. And I think people, this is a direction that people might want to hear. And uh, if you believe in that's, that's something that you have a voice to kind of give, which I think we all do, um, then, then start mapping out your plan. Uh, use that seven uh, structure story spine, the Ken Adams story spine, to block out how you want to lay out um, becoming an author for cartooning. Um, so that's my advice so far for that. I hope that helps. I own some Japanese storyboards and I've noticed that the story artists of those always indicate how long each shot takes in seconds and frames. Is that something story artists do in the West as well? Well, actually we always do stuff similar to that. Um, if we're building an animatic, uh, typically it depends on the editor uh, in terms of getting the final frame and the seconds and frame count for each shot that you do with storyboards. So in a typical scenario, if you're doing something independently, yes, you would probably build out your own animatic, time it out, and then block out those shots according to your locked animatic on how many frames and seconds they are, or seconds and frames. Um, it really comes down to the production because in a lot of the TV productions that I work on, um, typically they don't have you build animatics out. You board out what you think is ar around the right thing, around the right time, um, or you just board out the panels according to the script, and then you let the editor decide and the director of uh, the head of the story or the director of that project uh, or the, the director, which is basically another story artist. Uh, go in and do the final uh, lockdown animatic, which he will figure out the timing, and then that will be sent off into production. Uh, number four, what does an average day for you look like with storyboard work? Asking about studio jobs, but also want to want to know about freelancing, freelancing and contract jobs. Um, I have parentheses here, uh, example messaging, emails, warm ups, working with working meetings, breaks, etc. <clears throat> well. That's kind of a big thing to, to topic, but uh, the day in the life with me is, is a combination of all of those, uh, all of those things. Um, I check my emails the first thing in the morning to see if I've gotten anything, um, either from the late in the evening from the night before or early that morning. Um, I'll go in and I typically will do my own warm up sketches, um, which is what I'd post on my Instagram and Facebook and all of those other social media things. Um, and then we, during the week, since it, it varies right now, I'm in features, so we're in the middle of our second screening, so we're just getting ramped up. So it's a lot of uh, long meetings, a lot of story discussions, a lot of verbal story discussions, and then um, also writing a lot of notes. Um, I spent the last two weeks writing notes uh, for various concepts or ideas for how to improve or how to simplify the feature film. We were all given the platform as story as the story team to kind of give our two cents in and also to talk to one another as a group so that we can collaborate and see um, what works, what doesn't work. And then hopefully we all home in and we kind of come to a, uh, a universal agreement in terms of direction and what we're going to do for that show. And then um, break wise, I just break whenever I feel like it. Um, I've been working from home for six years. So um, it's, you know, 
at the end of the day, it comes down to what's my deadline? Can I meet it when, I, when I'm ready to pitch? It really comes down to how to time manage yourself. Um, I know how much work I can handle. I know how fast I can be when I need to be. So I, I, I kind of navigate through that. Um, and I usually spend, like I said before, when earlier on this masterclass, I usually spend a good couple of days when I'm looking at a script for the first time to spend literally just a couple of days thinking about it, writing little thumbnails down, just exploring and, and getting into my head in terms of the work, uh, the cinematic, and how I want the camera to flow for that, that show. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, next we have, will this recording be available? Yes, it is available. It probably has already get, came to you already. I ran out of charge for my iPad Pro, my only source of drawing on the computer, and I would really love to draw all over this. I love this masterclass. Well, that's awesome that you love it because you, now you're gonna get a video tutorial on all of these questions that I'm answering. So hopefully you've been having fun with what we've done so far the last month. And again, we apologize for getting this out to you a little late, but we are getting it to you now. How do I, how do I change the workspace on Storyboard back to its original setting? Uh, how do you change the workspace on Storyboard Pro back to its original setting? I think I pressed something and it changed to only what the camera sees. Um, go back to the original uh, recording of what we talked about um, when we were first having you set up with everything and there should be an alt. Also, um, there's lots of information that you can ask these questions and forums with Storyboard Pro um, through the Toon Boom website itself. And they're really good about getting back with you or getting back to you. The, the workspace should be up in the upper, I wanna say upper right, but um, there's a, a button up there that can press, I think, to default back to the original setting. At any rate, um, I am sorry, I do not have Storyboard Pro in front of me at the moment uh, when answering these questions. Uh, let's go to the next one. Is there any good resources you recommend to further understand acting and comedy to enhance our animation and storyboarding? Uh, wow, there's, there's so many. Um, I would say look at um, all the old silent films. If you want to really get into um, really good clear acting and pantomiming, watch, go back to filmmaking before sound and look at how um, actors had to uh, present themselves uh, in terms of without audio because they had to um, act externally and not internally. I mean, there's inner monologue and outward monologue and there's physical acting, uh, which is what a lot of like these musicals, uh, like Singing in Rain, uh, My Fair Lady, um, all of these particular movies have a very physical extra uh, extra I, I mean extrovert in terms of their pantomime and their and their physical dancing and acting and and we've always looked at those at least that's how I was trained and I found that looking at those and and looking at life acting it out yourself uh, was really helpful I mean you know the the age-old tradition of, of looking in a mirror or recording yourself with the technology we have now allows you to kind of do several takes of an idea that you want to get across. And really, once you have that document, let's say you videotape yourself, then as a story artist, it's a matter of finding the clear poses that are going to give the intent or the acting that you need without over animating it or out over storyboarding it. So it's, it's finding that right, um, that right pose in the right place. I'll be doing a tutorial series on how to animate um, for acting, uh, how to animate and act for storyboarding. Um, and that will be coming out after the first one that we're doing, which is uh, the 50 most popular or the, the, the most important shots you need to know for storyboarding and why. So we're putting that out soon. Can you talk more about thinking in isometric 3D for camera mapping? The way you laid out everything the way you laid everything out and translating that to thumbs with grids, not show the rule of thirds, and but the grids, the eye line, the ground plane, uh, sky, wall, et cetera, good, uh, et cetera, and grids like that. Now, if you go to, um, trying to remember what I have for the Back to Basics tutorials, um, but I believe I have something in there that talks about the rule of thirds, um, perspective, eye line, but essentially, um, you got to think in terms of 3D, and this what this does is it helps you to create a placement of 
composition for where you want your characters to be either in the foreground or in the background either you want them up high or down low do you want them dominant in the scene or you want them um, minuscule you know you want them to be not less dominant in the scene uh, this is the rule of thirds which is loosely based off the idea of the golden mean which is this breaking up uh, which is creating a spiral a spiral effect for the rule of thirds and this is helping you to create the the perfect composition um, breaking your 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 viewpoints in into thirds or into more dominant or, or less dominant um, this would be the golden mean and by all means look up these google these uh, google any of these because they're online accessible for you guys to look at you know if i'm going to let's say have a shot down below right here and I want to uh, create my eye line. Let's say I have a perspective like that. Now my golden, the golden mean or the rule of thirds, let's say it's the rule of thirds, helps me decide where do I want to place maybe a, a foreground element or a background element. And let's say, you know, I want to, I want to place one character here, and then I want to place the other character here. Now what this rule of thirds has helped me to do is this kind of grid out and map out where I would like to place everything. The eye line is creating where my horizon line is going to be, where the camera is placed. Is the camera, you know, if the eye if the line uh, is right there and the camera is right here, I'm seeing the background. I'm seeing the, the, the perspective of this right here through the camera's lens. Uh, the character that's in the foreground you know, might be right here, looking that way, this character could be way back here. And depending on how shallow or deep the depth of field is for my camera, which is right here, uh, will determine how far away or close it looks from the object. If you have everything in focus, you're going to have a longer depth of field as opposed to a shallower depth of field like if we're focusing mainly on this character here in the foreground or in the background, this guy, then this character will probably more than likely be way out of focus, meaning he'll be really blurry in this shot right here, meaning he'll end up looking, you know, for the shot to kind of create the depth, that shallower depth of field, he'll end up looking more like that because he's, he's closer to the camera and the camera is focusing its attention on the background character so therefore the background character is going to be in focus so everything past a certain depth of field which is the which is this um, basically if the character is here there's a depth of field that the camera is focusing on uh, so many feet in front and so many feet behind everything in here will be in focus anything going in closer from that point on will get gradually more and more out of focus and anything in the background will get gradually and gradually out of focus but let's say it might be you know my I might have a, a depth of field that's like this so our character is focused on here and then it slowly gets out of focus the further back you go but not as extreme as let's say the character that's in the foreground right there he'll be more out of focus because our depth of field is there. Now you can also create a depth of field that allows everything to be in focus if you wanted to. Um, but what you're doing is you're playing with the concept of depth of field in order to uh, create a, a, an illusion of depth um, and, and dramatic uh, feel that you want for that particular shot. And then gridding, gridding is essentially what I did. You know, I created that eye line and now I wanted to create a grid. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a grid to establish where the ground plane is, where my eye line is, and what what angle it's at, um, and that's a really quick way to you know create an upshot. If I wanted to do you know an upshot of something or a downshot, like I can do this quick grid, and now I can go in and say maybe I want to do an upshot of this character, and now I've got the sky in the background, and so now I've I've created this illusion of looking up at something or the same effect can look like it's down on something. So hopefully that helps you with that question. Um, and yeah, there you go. Would you make your storyboard pro uh, 
Would you make your Storyboard Pro brushes available for download or purchase at any point? Um, you know what? There's I don't I use all the basic ones, so I wouldn't necessarily use. Um, I, there wasn't really much that you would need, um, and I and if I do make any brushes, I would just offer them for free because they're really easy to create yourself. Um, but there are, I think, certain brushes that you can. In bring in import um, into uh, the latest version. I I um, I don't want to say I believe you could possibly do it with uh, Photoshop brushes. Um, but just be wary that you know any kind of filters that you put on with Storyboard Pro brushes uh, that are more textural, uh, they may take up memory space. So just be aware of that. Um, but Mike Morris, if you look him up, Mike Morris, uh, he's a director out there, the guy that um, helped me set up. Um, the presentation for you guys to do uh, Storyboard Pro setup. We will be doing a um, tutorial with him on how to uh, use Storyboard Pro, the latest version, uh, his approach to storyboarding and TV. So that's going to be something in the near future for us. How do you add the rule of thirds grid in Storyboard Pro? Um, well, I mean, you can, they have already grids set up in there that you can utilize. Um, you can also just create your own as a layer in there if you wanted to, or if you wanted to bring, bring something in as a imported PNG or TIFF file or JPEG, you can also import those from Photoshop. So any of those, the rule of thirds or the, uh, I think the rule of thirds is already in, built in there as a grid. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff for perspective grids. Um, but really it's just getting comfortable with doing it yourself, learning it yourself. Um, there's lots of PNGs and different things that you can get offline or online that you can download and import into this as well. Um, but I would I would recreate them as a, a vector file so that you keep your file size uh, smaller. Uh, we have Anthony's who says, oh yeah, I read the rule that to move the camera minimum 30 degrees, could you touch on this? Oh, I read a rule that says to move the camera a minimum of 30 degrees. I honestly have not heard that rule um, I board what feels right to me and how it works. Um, as a matter of fact, while we're here, I might just look that up real quick because I do not know. But at Sketch to Animate, we always want to answer everyone's questions. So let's see here. Okay, let's read this. Is 30 degree rule is a basic film editing guideline that states that the camera should move at least 30 degrees relative to the subject between successive shots of the same subject. If the camera moves less than 30 degrees, the transition between the shots can look like a jump cut, which could jar the audience and take them out of the story. The audience might focus on the film techniques rather than the narrative itself. The 30 degree change of angle makes two successful shots different enough to not look like a jump cut. However, camera movement should stay on the one side of the subject to follow the 180 degree rule. Okay, that's that. basically what they're saying there is when I was demonstrating how to go from a shot, one shot to kind of cutting in, I'm, my camera is staying on one, the 180 degree rule. I, I have the characters in front of me. There's a, there's a line, a dividing line that takes me from going from one side to the other. And I can play with the camera in the increments of going in and going out and then flopping back and forth between the two characters on that 180 degree rule or that line. And then if I want to kind of come out and I want to change the angle to break that 180 degree, typically what you want to do is either cut away to something else that's distracting the situation. They look off camera in the direction that it is and then you cut to that thing and then you can cut back at a different angle or you can cut in super, super tight like an extreme close up and then pop back out again on the other side to allow the, breathe, allow the audience to basically see what you're doing coming into something and then coming out because you don't want to, you want the camera to flow in a way that doesn't feel like it's being jump cut back and forth and uh, getting dizzy or g confusing the audience. Now, there are some people that are filmmakers that purposely do that to give the audience a feeling of uh, chaos and confusion. Um, so there will, pe there will be people that will use jump cuts as a, as a, a method of filming. Um, but typically when you're working on TV shows like we are, you don't want to, you want to, you want to keep to those rules. So I found this in Wikipedia. It seems pretty good. 
just look up the 30 degree rule and it should give you a pretty good explanation. And I would say it's a fair, fair assessment that it's a pretty, pretty, uh, a pretty good uh, definition of what the rule of uh, 30 degree rule is and also the 180 rule. Dakota says, when you board, how would showcase, how would you showcase fast camera motions such as a zoom or a quick pan? Um, one of the techniques that I like to use, um, and you can actually do it in Storyboard Pro, um, but if not, you can do it in Photoshop, is you use the, the zoom or filter, a zoom filter effect. Uh, so you're gonna create a, an in-between shot that's gonna take you from one moment to another moment, like in a close-up to the wide shot, and then you're gonna have an in-between. Sometimes I like to do a cushion, depending on how fast or slow it needs to be. I may uh, go to another position and increase the size of that or if it's a pan or if it's a zoom in, I might increase the size of the background a little bit, bring it up, and then create a zoom effect that has the, 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 the blur going outward towards the center point to kind of create the, the feeling that you're coming in. And then, um, and then I will cut to another extreme where I'll bring that really, really close into that same shot. And then I'll have a really pushed extreme and then I'll have the final shot, which is basically a nice clean line that ties you into that shot after those two panels that you've created. Um, you're gonna create those two panels normal and then you're going to blur them out uh, using an effects tool in Photoshop. And then you also have an effects tool in Storyboard Pro, uh, which we can get into that at a later date. Charlene Giles says, is there any good resources to recommend to further understanding acting comedy to enhance our animation and storyboarding? Again, go back to the other question uh, that I said previously, which is uh, follow, uh, look at silent films, read books on story, uh, listen to podcasts. Um, you know what? The one thing I didn't add, take an improv class. Uh, go to improv. Uh, go to comedy acting classes. Comedy is one of the hardest things to do in filmmaking and uh, and to board it well that's funny is really difficult and writing's challenging too. So look at sitcoms, look at t previous TV shows, look at filmmaking, take a film class on live action filmmaking. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the beauty of animation is that it creates this, the higher, uh, you know, it's continual education. I've, I felt like, I learned the most once I left um, the, the school and I went into my industry. That's where all of my knowledge and experience happened, uh, was there. So I would say definitely do all of those things that I just said. And if you can't afford to do those, there's, there's online classes. But immerse yourself in the idea of acting and what that is. Physical pantomiming. Um, those are things that are going to help you with your acting and storyboard. And then drawing, just drawing it over and over again. Repetition is the key to everything to get improve your skill set. Could you briefly go over what's the differences between comedy, drama, action, and storyboarding? Comedy, drama, action. I have a back to basics tutorial that kind of goes through that. So I would highly recommend you looking at that tutorial um, that talks about the types of portfolios you need and why. What should a portfolio consist of? Well, the above what the question that I just answered, which is a mixture of comedy, drama, and action. Again, go to my tutorial. I talk about that um, for TV. I talk about the differences and why you need those uh, different types of variety. Any suggestions on where to, to see resumes designed appropriately for the feel, I'm assuming for storyboarding. Resumes are gonna be your reel. If you wanna know what a storyboard artist reel is, go online and look for storyboard artists that you follow on Instagram. Look at, look at their reels. I mean, there's so many artists that I follow that are on Instagram, that are on LinkedIn. Look at what, how they have their reels set up and mimic that, you know? Find someone that you admire and say, okay, I wanna to get to this person's level of, of quality and look and feel. Um, and then use that as your guide to create your own, not meaning copy them, but Use, use their aesthetics to give you an idea of how you can put yourself out among the crowd. Uh, when is it appropriate to take liberties with the story like you did uh, with your pen test? Um, well, liberties is where it, it all depends on the, uh, the director and what uh, you ask the right questions. If you say, hey, can I explore some ideas here in this area? They will either say yes or no. 
And if it's your own, you know, since I was doing the test on my own, I did, I could do whatever I want. There was no direction because they wanted to see if Travis Blaze, myself, what he could add without any direction. Where is he level wise as a story artist? And does he know how to basically set up shots properly to have a sequential, a sequential boards that make sense and tell the right story? Um, so when it comes to a test, look at how they have made these films and then say, okay, this is the area in which they're, they're designing their cinematography. This is how they, they set up their episodes. I'm going to stay within this genre of, of filmmaking because this is sort of a good idea of indication of what they're looking for. Um, if you have that luxury of looking for those things, then do that. Look at those previous episodes and then gauge from there how far you can push something. Now, if you're in production, you just simply ask the question, hey, how far can I push this sequence here or this section here? And then they will give you a yay or nay answer or explain to you what they are looking for. In terms of planning, do you thumbnail the entire script first and then do your rough boards or do you do them in parts right after one another? Um, I will do them in sections, um, typically. Uh, if I really feel like um, good about, let's say, a TV, 11 minute TV script, I'll thumbnail through the whole entire thing. Typically, I like to split it up and then get sections in the first section, I like to share it with the director so I can see that if I'm in the right direction or not. Once I get notes from there, then I can continue thumbnailing in with those notes in mind to help me further my boards, my thumbnail boards moving forward. Um, and then I go in and I um, will do my roughs, pitch those, get notes, come back, do the finals, pitch that, and then that moves on to whatever notes I have after that will end up going to editorial. Uh, they'll end up doing an animatic and then revisionists will come in and fix any, any extra things that go, uh, need to happen within that show because I'm already going on to another episode. Do script pages have a time duration? A page equals a time of frame, one minute or something. So when you get a script, you generally know how long of a sequence you are boarding. Uh, yes, typically it's about, they always say the average is about a minute per script, but that could, that could vary because you can have a 22 page script for an 11 minute show but there's a lot of dialogue or there's a lot of explanation to a setup that just takes time to explain, but doesn't have to necessarily take screen time to visually board out. Uh, it, it really is dependent on how wordy the, uh, the dialogue is. Uh, I have seen films that are, you know, long and, and when you read the script and you go, you know, no matter how we cut this, this is going to be a long script. This is going to go over the time that we need. We already know that, for features, we want to stay around the 90 minute mark. We know that for TV, if it's an 11, uh, it's broken up into segments, either two 11 minutes or one half hour, or in the case of Netflix, there it could go run 40 to 45 minutes. Um, you can see shows that are, are around that range, especially with like Big Mouth and other shows like that. So um, you already have a sort of a set limit of time that one each go, that needs to be consistent. So uh, sometimes the writers overwrite. And then you have to kind of backpedal and, and bring it back down again. And the only way you know that is when it gets boarded out and you can see, oh yeah, we've, we've done too much. Let's cut this out. Let's cut that out. Let's simplify the story there. What sort of process do you have when working with new characters on a project? Hopefully I get model sheets. And when, if I get model sheets, then that's great. I, I sit there and I spend a couple of days just practicing drawing over them, pushing them in different poses. Reading the script and, and, and pushing them according to what's in the script. I'll, I'll look at the script and I'll read something. If there's an action shot of, the, of a character jumping, I'll practice the character jumping. Um, if the character's sitting there crying, I'll practice the character crying. Um, you know, if, uh, if the character is um, laughing or, you know, running around acting crazy, then I'll go in and I'll do poses that kind of accentuate what's going on in the script. The script is there as a guide to help you stay within character of whatever character designs you have put in front of you as far as model sheets go. So I would say uh, do that. Um, I, I, that's how I approach it. And then what I'm doing in that process, because I'm not going to go full out detailed with the characters, I tend to find try to find a shorthand, a simplified version of that model sheet so that I can draw that character out quickly, but staying within the same proportions of the character. I'll, I'll simplify the line mileage uh, while staying in the same shape language so that I can draw my boards fast. Um, because depending on what show you're on, 
you may need to be on model or you may can or if it's a 3d film you can be looser with it I, i've been on both um like i said before with pen zero was loose relatively loose uh disenchantment you had to be spot on tight with the, with the characters and uh, you could still be loose in your lines but you had to be detailed and on model for the expressions and everything else because those particular boards will actually be used in the production process as opposed to let's say a 3d film where they'll use the idea of the acting and the staging but they won't necessarily use verbatim that drawing that i just put down there what is the name of the writing software well i use writer duet which is a great writing software also if you get a if you pay a certain amount you can share um, that with others where you can you can collaborate and, and write uh, live with them final draft is another one that people use that's that's sort of the industry standard so when you go to um, Storyboard sort of pro and you want to import a final draft then you can go in there and plop them in and then uh, it imports the final draft now writer duet can also export as a final draft it's almost like it's become such a standard it would be this equivalent to like most programs can import or export PSDs because PSDs are so integrated into the way we we develop and work our, our projects. And I'm getting a lot of light on me now. So uh, bear with me as I get dr drenched with sunlight. Um, would you be able to show an example in how to use vector, for example, when you use the background from a previous scene or bring it into your own scene? Um, my, my own suggestion is look at what we've done so far. Um, I can We can do that at a later date. What we're gonna do is that's good. We're going to focus mostly on approaching how to use a Storbo Pro with Mike Morris. And so we're going to find all of that stuff in the later months, hopefully later this year, or hopefully before the end of the year, we'll have something like that for you. In a roundtable presentation for productions, would you be allowed to make a voice recording for notes? Yes. Um, in some instances, yes. I actually record my own pitches. When it, with, with the project that I'm currently on. So they, they asked me to record and I find that very helpful. I mean, in terms of pitching, I would record and do that. But when you're in a room, when there's a round table discussion like I am now uh, with this feature that I'm on, we record everything. So later on, uh, not only do we get a document that someone in the, one of the production assistants is actually typing in all of the information, but we're also getting um, a video presentation from Zoom of that so we have both the video that we can watch and refer to plus we have the um, the notes that were given to us when including a camera mapping panel should you put it before the shot or after camera mapping is just for my own personal use to figure out how I'm going to stage my boards it will never be in my actual boarding process when I show it to people um, Unless, of course, I need to answer, ask questions to the director before I actually start boarding, then I will introduce my camera mapping to show examples of what I'm doing. And then this is why I came up with the shot, but you'll never use it actual in production. Any, on, any advice on how to learn how to draw on character model? Well, yes, draw on character. How? Trace the character over and over again. Then draw next to the character repetition and key is everything um, you don't have to unless you're a uh, a cleanup artist or a, sto a storyboard revisionist and you're doing final boards uh, for let's say uh, adult comedy like simpsons or family guy or disenchantment or, or big mouth you're gonna have to learn to draw and model and you're gonna uh, be able to you're gonna need to pull from previous or existing shows or scenes that have been done with those characters and if there's a shot that's similar to that you can pull from that trace over or even use that shot because it's in Storyboard Pro and it's vector you might even be able to use that same character from a previous shot imported into your scene and make it work for your shot um, so tracing studying and just doing just repetition that's the only way you're gonna get better um, there's no easy button. There's no magical button. It's all labor intensive. You either got to love it or you get another job or find another profession because it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of rewarding work. And when you finally break through the, that plateau and you elevate to the next level of, of, uh, storyboarding, you're going to, you're going to really, really, really fall in love with the process and how we do our boards. What sort of costs would you be looking for, looking at for four to six weeks? 
Uh, well, typically, you know, it depends on the rate, you know, uh, or the budget. Uh, all of us artists have different rates. I tend to be, I'm a senior story artist, so I will tend to be on a higher end weekly rate. And they're hiring me because of my experience. They're hiring me because of my speed. They're hiring me, me because of my, my knowledge and communication skills as a story artist. I mean, drawing good is one thing, but being able to communicate what you're drawing and also being able to take notes and take direction and take criticism, all of these things happen with experience and time. And so all of that is quantified by a price. Um, I know a set rate that I want, and so I will give that rate. Now, a range can be anywhere between 1950 to 2000, all the way up to 27 to 3500, depending on a week, depending on if you're in TV or if you're in features. Um, every budget has its own uh, price tag, meaning it has its own uh, level of budget that the studio is willing to give for the production value of what they're looking for. And um, so it can vary. I mean, my I have a set rate that I like to be at, but I fluctuate. I have a range that I fluctuate in between. I will not take a minimum of this. I have a cutoff, and then anything above that's golden to me. Um, so hopefully that helps. What are the future trends of TV animation that could affect storyboard artists? Is it required to use 3D programs? No, it's not required. Um, that's the beauty of, of traditional storyboarding as far as I understand, or as far as what I've experienced over the last 30, well, for me now it's been 15 years of storyboarding. I have found that no matter how advanced technology gets, they, they still can't get rid of the rudimentary idea of shot and visual story uh, st storytelling with dr traditional drawing, actual 2D drawing. Um, you know, now some productions may say, oh, we'll just hop to pre because it's a 3D. They already have the characters built out, so we'll just pre it all out in, in, in a board animatic form rather than drawing it. Well, that's great for, for that production if they want to do it that way, but nine times out of ten, you're going to want a storyboard artist to go in there and quickly, I bet you we can go in there and board something faster or at least similar and better than a pre would be on a complicated character. Um, especially we can get the nuances of acting and, and expression and things that we might want to accentuate for that particular shot that's going to help the artists and the animators later on. Not just simply posing the character out in a composition, but you need acting in there as well. So there's, there's lots of things that aesthetically a story artist brings to the table that you just can't get with a 3D program. I think that where we are currently in our industry we're going to be like this for quite a while, and I think it's just going to get better in terms of story artists, because no matter where you go and what medium, they're always going to need someone to traditionally board something out. How would you recommend getting an internship? I have been applying to so many, but no luck. Um, I, I, I don't really have the best, great advice for that, other than try to find the the studio that really fits you, uh, the culturally the 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 type of shows that they've produced, the type of artists that they have come out of that studio. Um, what is, does it resonate with you? And if it does, cater to that, that environment. You know, working at Disney versus working at Cartoon Network versus at working at Nickelodeon are completely different styles and cultures um, on how they, they approach storytelling. Um, so each one's going to have its own thing that you're going to either like or don't like. So really focus in on and do your research and your homework and then try to create shows that that inspire you you know emulate shows of your own original concepts that are inspired by these these studios that make these wonderful movies and TV productions and then see what happens from there are you allowed to trace model sheets yes you are depending on where you are of course tracing model sheets if it fits the need they do it all the time on Simpsons and, and Family Guy and, and Big Mouth and but there's gonna be there's like I said there's gonna be places where you might want to reuse a shot from a previous scene that fits the same composition and angle that you're doing. Say, oh, I can grab that because it's vector based and they do it all in, in Starver Pro, you can easily import and find those assets to trace over yourself and utilize it for your own means. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with tracing model sheets, but it's never gonna take the place of being able to draw well. 
Drain, being able to draw well is cr crucial to being a good story artist. And then if you tr have to trace in the process to fit a certain deadline or a thing that needs to get out, then you're, you can do that, but it doesn't become a crutch. You don't want tracing to become, become a crutch. That's the only thing and the only way that you can produce uh, a good story. Do you have any tips for boarding those perspective changes in action? Camera mapping. You know, if you want to, if you want to really find uh, how to properly uh, do that, then look at a, a create the set, look at it in, a, in sort of a 3D downshot mode, and think about where you're placing your characters and where they're running around, uh, and then think about progression. If you're going to a left to right direction uh, for a particular action. Keep that, keep in that direction. If you're going to change direction, pull out, come out wide and change the direction and angle and allow the, 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 the character or the audience to breathe and see where you change your camper, camera angle. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can approach action and there's some really phenomenal action directors and story artists that are out there today. I see a ton of it. Everyone is all starting to look the same to me but they're all phenomenal. They're all great, but they all kind of do the same type of similar shots. So there's plenty, plenty of shot progressions and sequences of action shots that you can look at for reference. Look at Instagram. They're all over the map. They're all over the place there. Are the backgrounds for this pre-designed for your reference or are you doing rough designs based on story moments? That depends. A lot of times there won't be backgrounds made, so we have to have background background shots that we can pull reference from to create our own new layouts or backgrounds. Um, that's where the gridding comes in. If you don't have a defined um, design for a building or anything else, that, but you have a sort of shape and look and feel and camera direction you want to go in, that's where the gridding and the perspective uh, blocking uh, really helps you in terms of blocking something out to get to get the camera depth and feel that you want without having to spend a lot of time in your layout. Um, and then you'll get, sometimes you'll get layouts that are great and you can incorporate that and then you just look at the layout, the master layout, and then you, if you need to change the camera angle, you just look at the master layout and you figure out what it may look like from this down shot or this up shot. Um, and you kind of make it up as you go. But in, in general, backgrounds, it depends on what where you're coming into the production. If it's TV or if it's first season and you're just starting out, you may not have hardly anything. If you're coming in third season on a show, you may have a ton, more than likely you have a ton of reference to look at. Um, Melanie says, also understanding this class is more geared for TV standards. I hear boarders talk a lot about using Photoshop and TV Paint versus Storybook Pro, and I'm kind of curious what would prompt you prompt using these packages instead. Well, the only way those particular packages would be used is if the production pipeline does not require you to use Storybook Pro. Most studios have gotten um, close ties and created pipelines pipelines with Toon Boom Pro, or I'm sorry, with Toon Boom, that pretty much say that all they want is you to learn Storyboard Pro. So you're kind of forced into this parameter of having to work like that because that's the workflow process that they've done for the last 10 plus years. And now that they've done it kind of like, it's hard to reverse engineer that. Um, the times that I can use other programs is when I'm in features. Uh, if they don't care that I'm using TV Paint, I'm gonna use TV Paint. And the reason why is it's easier to use the timeline for me than it is anything else. Um, Photoshop I've used in the past, um, but again, that depends on the production itself. Do you use thumbnail before you create beat boards? Yes and no. I might thumbnail, uh, if I'm creating an original idea, um, I'll, I'll use beat boards for the, the blocking of my overall concept. The beat boards help me establish the style in which I'm boarding. If I'm on a TV show that's already existing that had previous shows, I don't necessarily, I will beat board out an idea to, to showcase to the director, but typically I'll thumbnail it out in sections because I already have a fairly good idea of the type of shot that they're looking, shots that they're looking for. Beat boards, for instance, I'm using those right now for this feature film because 
we want to go in a different direction with the theme and story of this feature that we've been on. So we are we blocked out a new outline. So therefore, rather than going in and going to full board mode, we are dividing and conquering and doing beat boards for those ideas to kind of gen get a general look and feel of what we're what we're trying to get across to see if it works before we invest too much time in thumbnailing and storyboarding out. Uh, so beat boards are really essential when it comes to things, moments like that in development when you're creating a story itself. Um, you may not always do beat boards when you are putting together, a, working from a script on a TV show. You may um, do thumbnail beat boards to kind of get an idea of asking a question of what a gag or a situation you might want to happen. Um, but then you're going to just go ahead and thumbnail it for the TV show. Do you ever use the, the built-in guide tools that Storyboard Pro has? Sometimes I will for, for uh, action shots or action uh, grid, like where my action um, needs to be. Or um, I might use the rule of thirds in there sometimes. But I've gotten to the point now where I don't need it. Um, that's there for possibly complicated shots, creating per, uh, complicated perspectives, or for artists that need to rely on it. Um, it's, it's there for beginners. Uh, it's there for everyone, but typically, you know, beginners use it to kind of get used to it. And then you kind of put it to the side and if you, and it's always nice to have there than rather not have it there. If that, if that makes any sense. So what helps you move through boards quickly? I feel like I often get stuck thinking about a shot and stop and then stop drawing. Um, camera mapping and thumbnailing is really going to be crucial to helping you because you can you can do small thumbnails and quickly put those out and just do simple things to get that that um the idea out of your head faster the, the the whole concept of thumbnailing is getting what's in your brain on paper as fast as possible before you lose the moment because we all lose the moment you know some of us have photographic memories others have very short term memories so the faster you can draw something and get it out i mean i'll i'll play it over and over and over and over again until i see it concretely and then i thumbnail it out and then i'll board it um and even then sometimes i'll lose the moment so if i can't quickly draw something down fast i'll lose the moment even if it's just a chicken scratch to get it down i try to get it down as fast as possible uh, and so that is it guys. I think I answered pretty much all the questions. Okay. Well, here we go. I thought I was done, but apparently we had more questions to be answered. So I am here to answer more questions. Can Travis briefly explain how he addresses the director's notes when he, she says they want things to be more cinematic? When they say cinematic, um, I think they're referring to the fact that they want to see those boards uh, feel like they're more, uh, you're taking more use of cameras, depth of field, uh, wider scope, um, really getting away from the sitcom style of uh, boarding that we tend to do, which is, uh, wide, you know, medium shots to uh, establishing shots to, two, to you know, the two medium close ups that are more flat three quarter stage that feel like they're in a theater as opposed to getting more cinematic, which is more getting more interesting poses. You know, you could have two characters staring at each other three quarter and three quarter front and that becomes flat and staged very kind of flat. Whereas if you shifted it over more and gave it a little bit more depth, that's creating a more cinematic appeal to your storyboards. So look at live action, look at ways of breaking up your boards so they don't feel flat and generic and more like that stage sitcom theater. Now other shows may want you to do that, but when they say to get more cinematic, they're really talking about playing against your foreground, middle ground and background, creating interesting dynamic angles that can compose uh, the same type of shot in an interesting way that's taking you from the typical theater stage like setting. What three things would you suggest we do every day to get better at storyboarding? Get a sketchbook and sketch, or if you don't have a sketchbook, you have an iPad, get out and do warm up sketches every day. Make that your daily habit. Warm up sketches either on paper and pen, 
or paper, uh, paper and pen or sketchbook or get on the, in, in your Photoshop or iPad or whatever software you have and just start warming up and doing sketches. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is um, practice thumbnailing. Uh, practice looking around you and creating storyboard panels, square, you know, little formatted storyboard panels and just sketch layouts, sketch Look out your window like I am right now and, and, and look at a way to compose uh, your surroundings in an interesting way. Um, by doing that, you're creating compositions that are interesting. It's going to help you kind of get in the mode of feeling and thinking like a, uh, a camera. Uh, you know. Then also to get better, I would say you know look at other story artists' work, but also look at um, lots of live action films, uh, silent films. Just look, watch how well-known directors compose their shots. Think about how they're using the camera and in terms of telling a story. And then by doing that, still frame it and, and maybe sketch it out. Just practice doing film studies. That will help, I think, get you into more thinking in, in terms of cinematic uh, appeal and using that camera. Uh, to understand how these directors use the camera for their, their shot composition. Uh, it says here, so we can get one frame looked at in a draw over Twitch or our whole sequence. Oh, well, there you go. I'm kind of leading into that. Um, for draw over Mondays on Twitch, um, we can look at, you know, let's keep it limited to a scene, like one scene, if you want me to look at a scene, uh, or maybe a couple of shots. Um, a small sequence for for um, storyboarding is okay. Like if you if you give me a small chunk of, of storyboards that you want me to look at that have sort of a middle beginning and end, we can do that. We can uh, certainly go over those things. Um, character designs and uh, any kind of uh, animation uh, that you might want to show. Now, 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 not a lot of animation. Maybe one shot is, is what we may have time for. Uh, lately, we haven't been getting a lot of people doing sending us drawovers. So, uh, if you get an opportunity to send your stuff over to our drawover Mondays, and uh, we'll jump on those. When making your portfolio, when making your portfolio and doing your own boards, would you be able to show your own take on existing shows, or is that not recommended? It's better to have more original concept. It's it's nice if you want to look at shows and then board them out. Uh, and do your own take on them. But I, I think it would be better to create original uh, storylines and boards that kind of show your own story process and your own creativity. Um, and if, But if you have other shows that you've worked on uh, in terms of, of having a portfolio then it, and those have already been released, then you can show those. But in terms of looking at other people's uh, shows that have already been done and then boarding from those. I guess it's good for your own practice if you wanted to do that, but not. I wouldn't recommend it to put in your portfolio if that makes sense. Are there certain rules boarding for animation versus live action? There have been some who have said that there is no room for live action type shots in animation. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm not 100% sure who you're talking to or what exactly that means. Um, as I've said previously, I look at live action all the time to influence me on how I do my storyboards. And then I also look at life. I, I, I use my own eye as a camera. Uh, to So I am constantly in the live action world uh, that's inspiring me to do storyboards for uh, my shows uh, or feature projects that I'm working on. Travis, do you try to keep your shots to a minimum for more effective action timing? Um, I would say I try not to animate my boards. I typically end up animating a lot of my boards, but I try to figure out ways to simplify it for the action. It really depends on what the director or uh, production is looking for. Um, I do think it's always good to try to effectively find the, the right pose without, you know, you know, you could do an action in three poses or you can still illustrate the same action in one pose. It's, it's all about trying to home in on the right 
one singular pose that kind of expresses the idea or thought when it comes to storyboarding. You don't want to over animate. You don't want to over act. Um, you want to get the right acting beats and the right, and, and that's just going to happen over time. And it's going to happen over daily practice of finding your shorthand when it comes to action and acting for storyboards. Is there a general rule of thumb for how many panels equals a certain amount of time or a way to know how many panels will be needed for a scene? No, um, there really isn't. I mean, you can gauge on, you know, we, we can know how much time there probably will be for a shot, but you really, uh, what I do is when I read dialogue or if I read an action uh, on a script, I start playing that shot in my head or a sequence. I start, you know, several shots in my head and I start playing it over and over and over again. And I, and I sort of get a sense of my own general timing of what it could be. And based on my acting or action that I want it to be, um, I start putting my anime, I start posing out the characters. Meaning if a character is going, well, I don't really understand what you're saying. And, or there's, or in the tone, it could be, well, I don't really know what you're saying. I'll start thinking about the, that tone and I'll start thinking about the line of dialogue and I'll start thinking about, well, I don't really know what you're saying. So it could be, I don't really know what you're saying. I, I could be doing that maybe three poses. I could do it in maybe two poses or maybe I could do it in four poses. I don't really know what you're saying. You know, I could do this, ah, or this, ah, and then, you know, point. So I think about what my action and acting is going to be in my head, sort of like, like on the camera. And then I start breaking that down and simplifying as to what poses I think would ex properly express that action. And, and that's kind of how I approach um, timing and how many panels I'll need for it. Stephanie, Sh Stephanie Sia says, how do you get the right timing for a shot like a run sequence? Um, really that, that again goes back to what I was just talking about previously for timing. Um, thumbnailing it out, you know, I think about the action that I want to do that the particular run or the particular action, you know, the, the run is based on the personality of the character. Is it a fast run? Is it a slow run? Is it a jog? Is it someone running away from someone or somebody running after someone? Are they frantic? Are they happy? Um, you think of the mood, you think of the story point that's happening in the sh in that part of the script. And then you start to think about the character itself. Who is the character? What is their personality? How would they run if you were that? How would you run if you were that character? And then I start to break down the four basic poses. An up pose, a stretch pose coming down, and a squash pose. And then I do the uh, flip, the reciprocal of that. I might do a run in four poses, up, down, or six poses. You know, and a, a, a squash, a stretch, an almost contact, and then a squash again. So that's six poses. Four to six poses is what I would end up doing for a run. But with those four to six poses, it could be a number of different ways you could approach the acting and action uh, based on the character's personality and based on the motivation of what is put into the script. James says, and any tips to practice boarding for beginners without having, without having to draw too much? Any tips to practice boarding for beginners without having to draw too much? If you're asking me the question without having to draw too much, you might want to reconsider not being in storyboarding. <laughs> and I, I say that jokingly, but I say that seriously. Um, there is no substitute for drawing and you can never draw too much. Unless you're asking me any tips to practice boarding for beginners without having to draw too much, meaning how do you board and not overboard. And again, that comes down to practice and you end up having to draw a lot to get down to figuring out what the minimum is going to be. Uh, when I started out, I was always over animating and always overboarding my shots. And then over time, I started to figure out 
how to minimize that. I still overboard, but then I end up pulling boards out and I don't mind drawing too much. You, you have to draw too much. You need to draw too much. Drawing too much is the, the key to kind of simplifying how you draw. Uh, there, you're never gonna get that easy button to press. It's just gonna happen over time that you start to, to minimize and finalize the things that you need that, that, that home in on uh, getting the right pose at the right time. So unfortunately, drawing too much is part of the practice of being a storyboard artist. What are some good ways to break into the industry if you don't live in a major hotspot area like the coast? I'm in Kansas. Um, well, nowadays, everyone, I'm working with people that are all over the world and all, over, and, and all different parts of the country. Um, so really, it's, it's a matter of getting on these forums like we are now, like the Discord that we, that we have, um, finding other groups on Facebook or other social media platforms that allow you to engage with other artists that are like you and other professionals. Um, try to find forums where you can meet online other artists uh, and professionals like myself. Join those groups. Uh, watch podcasts. Research the studios that you want to work for because um, they're all over the world. There's so many good ones out there. And start building your portfolio based on the what those studios are looking for. But um, you don't have to necessarily live in a, in a hot spot anymore. Um, I, of course, I always had recommend that if you want to break into an industry that you would go and live for a little while near the epicenter where a lot of the action is happening, just so you could physically meet and be amongst the artists that are living there. But nowadays, especially with the pandemic, um, we have virtual meetups. We have lots of other ways of doing these things. And honestly, um, you don't have to be uh, well, you can, you know, you can be in Kansas and still work on a major feature production. I have friends that are in Idaho. I have friends that are in Toronto. I have friends that are in uh, Florida and Tennessee and Ireland, Mexico, um, Canada. They're all over the place um, that are all working uh, in different areas. As a matter of fact, I'm working with uh, people right now that are in Bangkok and London, and uh, Russia even. So um, the day of having to be in those hot spots isn't always necessary anymore. Um, eventually it'll get back to where you probably will have to at some point work for a studio in-house. But I think the way we've been running productions, it's not gonna be as, if you're good at what you do and you show that you can prove to them that you can work remotely efficiently, you're gonna get work. I've been doing it for six years now and it's been consistently working out for me so far. I have been in this industry a long time, but I do think that um, there is that possibility for you to work remotely now. Okay, how do you approach a storyboard with a big environments like a city? That's a good question. Um, try to get as much reference of the city as you can. This is where the camera mapping is gonna be really crucial um, to the process of developing that. You don't wanna overdo it. Um, you know, there's, there's, if you can get development work of, from the, the, the Viz Dev crew that might have already done some uh, city shots for that area to get the, the, the style of, of the show and its environments, then if that's accessible, then I would say go for that and grab that. Um, if not, I would say, you know, develop uh, a general mapping of the action or sequence that you want to do when it comes to a, um, when it comes to a city environment and, and really start the camera mapping is going to be really crucial to that process, especially if someone's walking down the street or you have something, uh, two characters that are engaging one, maybe one is down below on a street level and one is up on the fifth floor of an apartment and you want to create um, a sense of, you know, maybe they're arguing with each other and other people are coming out of different parts of the building and listening in and then maybe there's a garbage truck going by and they're, they're commenting or making their side comments to those people that are having this argument or fight or whatever it is. And, and, and understand the environment, you know, set up 
if there's trees, if there's, if there's uh, steps to the front of the building. Set up the camera mapping so you know how you want to set your cameras and then you can use that camera mapping for your, to create your environments. So um, that would be my suggestion. Can Sketch to Animate become a network for aspiring and current story artists? Yes, I believe we can. I believe that's one of our goals that we're trying to achieve. Um, I think the more people that join Sketch to Animate and join um, our Discord uh, and, and get involved with what we're trying to do, I think that will help you uh, to break into this industry. Um, I think that um, it will always be good to have a community. We're, we're trying to build a, a, a story community through Sketch to Animate. And that's one of the reasons why we have Discord. And that's one of the reasons why we have Twitch and why we have YouTube. Um, this coming year, we will be doing paid tutorials. So we will have that as well for you guys to look at. Um, so yes, I do believe. Samantha says, what are some other important skills needed in storyboarding outside of the actual drawing itself? I know time management is probably a big one. Any tips on that are also appreciated. Yes, drawing well is not the only thing. Being a good communicator and being willing to be open-minded for change. Um, being a story artist means you're gonna have to draw a lot. It means you're gonna have to redo a lot of things. It means that you may have to rethink things that you have so dead set in your mind of how a shot should be, but the director doesn't want it that way. You have to be willing and open to listen to what the director has and their feedback. Even if you don't agree with them, it doesn't matter because it's their show and you're the one that they hired to work on that production. So the idea is put your, um, and I even, I hate to use the word ego, but let your mind be open to the possibility of change as you draw. Think of yourself as a, a, a clay willing to be molded into the particular production that you're on. Um, learn how to ask the right questions. And the only way I could say how, what is that is, is, is by becoming more experienced as a storyboard artist, you start to tend to start asking more and more questions. The more directors you work for, the more questions you have the ability to ask because you've had experiences from previous ones which have given you um, reference to ask questions going into the next director or production that you're going to be working on. Um, so it's communication, it's taking notes, it's giving, uh, asking the right questions in terms of taking criticism is, is gonna be a, a crucial thing. And make sure you take good notes. Um, you, luckily we have production assistants that will be taking notes for you, but also don't always rely on that. Rely on trying to take good notes because as you write it down and you're listening, you're, you're pushing it more and more concretely in your head. So then when you get those notes, you'll remember exactly what it was that they were asking for and you can put it to memory. So those, those would be some of my suggestions. Would you be able to break up the video when it becomes available so we can have specific parts of the masterclass? Um, Kelly, I don't know if that's possible. Uh, we just downloaded it as it was. I think maybe at some point we, we could do that at a later date. Um, that really depends on uh, the, the bandwidth that, that um, Anita may have in order to do that. It is a very long class, um, so I'm not 100% sure if we would be able to do that. I think that's it. I think I answered all the questions. Wow, this is awesome. All right, everybody. Again, I'm Travis Blaze at sketch to animate On behalf of everyone here, I would like to thank everybody for attending our very first masterclass. And I really do hope that everything that I've uh, answered today has been helpful. And I really look forward to seeing more of your work on Discord and seeing you guys on our Twitch channel uh, whenever you can. And be looking out soon, uh, very soon, as we're planning our next uh, masterclass, which will probably be happening late June. And uh, if you're interested in that, we'll be putting some promotions out very soon for that. But in the meantime, please be safe, get out there and 
do some awesome stuff with work uh, with your storyboards and just enjoy the process of learning. Um, and we really, really do look forward to seeing you next time here at sketch to animate And with that, I will say goodbye. <laughs>